All right, so last week we started with John chapter 11. Today I'm going to read the story because we didn't read it all. I'm going to read some of the parts of the story and we're going to take it up from here. Uh, you remember when Jesus last week uh, said to them that uh, Lazarus was sleeping, let us go that I will wake him up. And one of the things we lay emphasis on last week is the point of, at the point when Jesus had not showed up, when we have not seen the hand of God, what should be our attitude? That was the major thing we talked about last week. And we've learned to always put our reliance on God. So now, in this story of Lazarus, uh, verse 17 to 30 was when Jesus arrived. Uh, people were standing nearby. People were crying. And uh, Martha began to say to Jesus from verse 38 that the smell is terrible. And verse 39, she said, Jesus said, roll the stone aside. Jesus told them, but Martha, the dead man's sister protested, Lord, he has been dead for four days. The smell will be terrible. Jesus responded, didn't I tell you that you will see God's glory if you believe? 41, so they rolled the stone aside. Then Jesus, then Jesus, um, looked up to heaven and said, Father, thank you for hearing me. You, you always hear me, but I said it out loud for the sake of these people standing here, so they will believe you sent me. Then Jesus shouted, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out, his hands and feet bound in grave clothes, his face wrapped in a cloth, Jesus told them, unwrap him and let him go. Now, when we look at this story, there are a lot of many things that is very sweet and appealing. We could follow the emotions of the story. Yes, they had Jesus was coming. Somebody ran out to meet him. They sent for the other sister. People around were willing, this and that. And when we take a look at the sum total of all of this, it is a story that ended well to the family of Lazarus. Mary and Martha were glad that finally our brother came back to life. Now, for the sake of this Bible story, I had done some investigation which I'm going to show to us. If the story is all about Lazarus, family being excited and receiving joy because their brother came to life. I think that conclusion or that story in itself defeats the purpose in which the book of John was written. Because the book of John was written for a purpose. And the purpose for which it was written is something that we don't we need to keep our our eyes on it and see if the purpose for which it is written and this the ending of what we could come to a conclusion logically of this story if they correlate with one another uh, so the purpose of the book of john is written in john chapter 20, verse 31, and it says, but these are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that believing in him, you will have life by the power of his name. So following the story and just coming to a conclusion that Mary and Martha, Jesus restored joy to them. And you've been led to pray powerful prayer. 
that everything that has taken away your joy, every joy that is dead in your life, be restored and we shall aim it. Yet, it sounds good to us as human beings, but it contradicts the purpose for which this book was written. The book was written so that we can continue to believe. So when you look at that word, continue to believe, if we now reverse in John chapter 11 itself, John 11, Jesus said to them, first in uh, verse 11, that our, Lazar, our friend Lazarus is dead, but now I will go and wake him up. The disciples were afraid for their lives because Thomas said, okay, it is no problem. We know this man. Let us go with him. The place where he was, they have attempted to kill him is a place he is also going back to. But you see, verse 15 said something very crucial. Jesus said, and for your sake, I was glad I wasn't there. Now you will really believe. Let us go and see. Now, if you look at John eleven fifteen that says, I was glad for your sake, you will really believe, and you connect it to the purpose of the book of John in John chapter 20, verse 31, that says that this will are written for you to continue to believe. You can see a parallel. That's okay. Yes, Jesus said that you will really believe. John was written so that we can really believe. So this is like the crossroad of why this story made it into the book of John. So that we may really believe Jesus said, and for your sake, I was glad I wasn't there. For now, you will really believe. Come, let us go see him. Now imagine that, and the glad, Bra Paul opened this up yesterday. The way this glad in the original is not like the glad that we have now. You see, it's like somebody breaking the news to me that, uh, there is war in Nigeria, that they started civil war. And I say, eh, I'm dancing. <laughs> Ogawa, you dancing, shaku shaku dance. When you are saying that there is war in Nigeria, you say you are going there. Why are you excited about going to Nigeria where there is a civil war? You can see that, but people are dying in Nigeria. There is no correlation between your dancing and the news that we brought to you. Okay, now let us look at it. If the purpose was just to raise Lazarus, is the reason why Jesus was dancing. Lazarus eventually died. And he died in Cyprus. His tomb is there where they put it in Lanika. Lanika in Cyprus. I think Lanika is in Cyprus, right? Yes. You're on mute. Lanaka is in Cyprus. Yes. He died in Lanaka. And they, about in 1400, 14, year 1400, after death. Just 400 years later, they put a temple there. They, and they said that Lazarus, history has that, that Lazarus became a pastor in that place. Teaching people when he died, they put there, Lazarus, the man that died twice. Lazarus eventually died. So if Lazarus eventually died, the reason why Jesus was exceedingly glad was not because of raising Lazarus up. So, there is a trivial question that I really love and I'm going to ask us today. And I want us to try to answer the question. What, why is Jesus glad and excited about the purpose that his disciples we truly believe rather than for Lazarus to be awakened? That is a question. Let me pause. Let me know who is going to answer. We are going to keep that. I won't give you the clue now. <laughs> I think you will get it by the time we progress. So now, when you look at this statement about Jesus, I meditated a lot today and my head was spinning. When Jesus said in verse 15, for your sake I am glad. 
that now you will really believe. So I now look at it that didn't the guys believe before? They believed though. And let me give you some proof that they believed before. Let's take a quick journey to John chapter 1. In John chapter 1, after John had pointed Jesus out, the verse 37 says, when John's two disciples heard this, they followed Jesus. Jesus looked around and saw them following. What do you want? He asked. They replied, which means, Rabbi, where are you staying? Their indication, if you remember our John chapter 1, is because we are coming to where you are. Because answering us here, our case is not a take short answer and go. We need to be with you. If you continue, verse 34 says, come and see. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon when they went to see him at the place he was staying and they remained with him for the rest of the day. Eating barbecue, you will find out. When they finished, the Bible says, Andrew, verse 41, went to find his brother Simon and told him, we have found the Messiah, means the Christ. Then Andrew brought Peter to Jesus. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, come, follow me. When Philip went to report to his brother Nathaniel, he looked at what he said. We have found the very person Moses and the prophets wrote about. His name is Jesus, the son of Joseph, Joseph from Nazareth. So that means this guy, even Nathaniel, had some doubt because Nat, uh, Nazareth was not written in the Bible. Bethlehem was in the prophecy, but not Nazareth. He didn't know that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, but raised in Nazareth. In Nazareth. Like me now, I was born in Nigeria and raised in Canada. So if you look at me now, and you're speaking to me just as a Canadian, you missed a part of me, which is where I was born. But you see, when he met with Nathaniel that had this doubt, Nathaniel said to him, after Jesus told him some things, Rabbi, verse 49, John 1, 49, you are the son of God, the king of Israel. Now, listen carefully to what Jesus said. Jesus asked him, do you believe this? Just because I told you I have seen you other in fig tree, you will see greater things than this. I tell you the truth. You will see, you will all see heaven open and angels of God going up and down on the Son of Man, the one who is the stairway between heaven and heart. So when he's telling them now that they will really believe, so if this will take you beyond conviction that I am that fellow. The guys believed already. But you see, there is level of belief and belief get great. There are some things you believe that could never happen to you until some other things happen. Yes, Sister Soga, you raise your hand. Yes. Um, in response to your question, based on your explanation, yes, I would, I would say, yeah, the, guy, the, the disciples already believed that Jesus is the Son of God, but um, by, Jesus already knew he was going to raise up Lazarus. So that was them witnessing him raising the dead was a pointer to Christ being God himself, being a deity, which the book of John is really about. So I think Jesus was, um, Jesus was happy. He, 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 was, 
he liked it that they were going to see him raise the dead and that would build the faith of his disciples. Excellent. You've, you've, you've touched, in fact, your last phrase, that will build their faith. Yay. <laughs> I'm serious. So for Jesus now, he is more interested in things that will build your faith, keep your eyes on Jesus, than things that will give you temporary joy. Because the same Lazarus, that people will be shouting, hey, the dead man is away, he eventually died. So if he still ended in death, Ezekiah, many people will say, oh, he prayed, God answered. He still died after 15 years. So anything that still ends in death is temporal. But our faith is eternal. Because it takes us, our faith takes us beyond where we are physically and connects us directly to God. And it is that belief in Jesus that we eventually take us, lead us, keep us in eternity that we have. So now, let's go back to John 11. Jesus was glad because he was exceedingly glad because this would be an opportunity for those guys, for their faith to be built. You see, when I was meditating upon this, there's also an account that happened. And we're going to see the reaction of Jesus that there is no accident, there is no, most of the things he does are spot on. In, in Mark chapter 1, verse 14, you know, Mark is a summary book. Mark does a lot of summary. He just gives you pam, 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 pam. Look at this. In Mark chapter 1, verse 14. Later on, after John was arrested, in fact, some uh, version says that arrest was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee where he preached God's good news. Ha! People that, many people knew Jesus because of John. And this John, was thrown in prison. Jesus did not go out to say, hey guys, let me come and encourage you, motivate you, persuade you, comfort you. He just went out to be preaching the good news. What would the good news do to the people? The good news is to put people's faith on God and not on John, their prophet that they know. So, any time, anything that keeps us away from the good news, brethren, it's an highway to destruction. No matter what this, I, I know people that it is when, when something terrible happens, the first thing is no church that Sunday, maybe the next Sunday, they'll say they just want to sit down and chill. You don't have to go to a place, but you have to keep your ears and your eyes on the message of Christ. But some of them will not even log in to their churches online. They will just abandon it completely. Now, oh, the death of this, my brother, pained me so much. Let me leave God for a while. That is a dangerous situation, and we need to be mindful about it. Now, I now also now understood one of the things we talked about, uh, the woman by the well in John chapter 4. Many of us were here, and we remember that that woman by the well, after Jesus was talking to her, she was first concerned about the cause of household trouble, fetching water, when Jesus was talking about spring with Bob, he said, give me this water, please, so I don't have to come to this well. She was too concerned about household proper labor. But you see, by the time the truth of the gospel 
got to that woman, she left all her worries, left all her pain, left even the bucket she came with, went to the city. So we should begin to see something now. What the gospel, the good news, which gives you faith in God, what it can do to us. All right. So, when Jesus now spoke to them about this, that you will truly believe, he had told them already in John chapter 1, 50 to 51 that we read earlier, that if this one is what is making you to marry, because I just told you, you will still see things. So, that means the moment we put our faith in God, though we could be having temporary pain, we could be having temporary situations, but overall, Jesus is more concerned about our faith than our pain. And as human beings, we are always looking for how to eradicate our pain. That is why in most churches, most of the messages, the prayers, the prophetic declaration are consistently trying to remove pain from you. Their goal is not to put your faith in God. Their goal is to try by whatever means they could to make either to make you feel or some we either use other means to try to take your pain away or take that pain and give you another pain. So that you know that at least one left, but now I have a new one. Let me remain here so that the pain can go. So, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> I want us to keep this in mind. God is not necessarily happy <coughs> or rejoicing that troubles happen to us. However, through those troubles, through those pains, is an opportunity for our faith in God to be reestablished. You know what I've re realized? Without pain, it's very easy to coast in life. Very easy to, to do what? To coast. Okay. Then you begin to drift. No coasting is where you are just going anywhere, no destination. Everywhere we look like it. When everything is perfect, smooth around you, you know, I, I don't think you will have too much passion just to bury yourself in the things of God. Because let me paint this picture to you. If you are truly a believer, even when you don't have trouble, the trouble of other people will become your trouble. Sorry, one. So the trouble of other people, you, you, do, you, have, you have a perfect life. Everything is fine. Husband, children, finances, career, everything is at peace. But for you to demonstrate the love of God to your fellow human being, other people's problem will not be your own problem. And those problems will make you to reflect that, ah, this life, it's like a vapor. If you just see somebody that is young and just died, ah, fear will grip your heart. In your comfort state, you'll be uncomfortable. So it is essential for us to know that there is always a perspective of God to the ugly situations around us. And when we align ourselves with God, it is always an opportunity for the glory of God to be manifested. 
So now, when we look at this story, and Jesus got to the grave of Lazarus, and Jesus said to them, he said, he shouted, Lazarus, comfort. When he shouted that Lazarus should come forth, the Bible told us clearly that the man that was dead came out. But this man came out. In fact, there are going to be two parts to this. The blind, the dead man came out, his hands and feet bound in grave clothes. His face was wrapped. Then Jesus brought him out by his words. And you see, first I'm going to debunk one of the first food that has been preached. And this was preached by a very popular pastor in the, in the region where I live. And he said that when Lazarus came out, and he said, there is still something for you to do. Because you need aid for Lazarus to be untied. And he preached that message to actually point, put himself into the position. He called them destiny helpers. Hmm. People that will push you forward in destiny. And these are his words. The power of God that could bring a dead man bound. How did it work out? It was the power of God that brought it. But God said, God still used man to finish his job. Hmm. So now see this. The power of God through the word of God brought Lazarus out. But you see, the people did not rush to go and untie Lazarus. Their emotion did not overwhelm them to go and unwrap him or to go and grab him. It was still at the command of God's word that the people took action to untie Lazarus. So are these people now helping God? No. They are acting on the instruction of God. And for this very purpose, God gave teachers. He gave gifts to men. In Ephesians 4, 11 to 13, those men are never to use, do anything out of their emotion. Their goal must be to use the same word of God to perfect the people of God. I'll put it to you in another way. When the church started and the Hellenist Jews in Acts chapter 2 were complaining, I think after chapter 6, that they are not being taken care of. You know what the apostles said? The apostles said, let us appoint men that will lose this burden from people while we keep to what? Preaching the word of God. Jesus was no longer there physically. They now are the one releasing the word of God by preaching. And he said, let other men now be the one to do the work, to unwrap it. So, if so, will you now look at the deacons they appointed that they are now helping the gospel to spread? Oh, are oh, the deacons are now the powerful guys? No. The word of God is supreme. And the truth of the word of God must never be overlooked. It is still at the command of his words that Lazarus was loosed. The power of God is enough 
by itself to bring Lazarus out and to remove the grave clothes around him. But Jesus, in his wisdom, is setting up something for us. Not that without those men, Lazarus is no longer alive. No, he's alive. But you see, there will be things, and that is why I want to appeal to you. If you have not found, I know this is a fellowship, no doubt. But you know, our goal is not to keep you here forever. Our goal is to mature you and you move on. But if you move on, please go and find yourself. Start your own work now about church that you will attend where they will take the word of God and use it to shape on you. Where they will use the word of God to perfect the saints. And we must never choose by proximity, decoration, uh, how they package the church, how, the, how eloquent the pastor is. I reshared the post on Facebook this week. I'm going, in fact, let me find it because I think it's in, it says, do not go where it is all fine music, grand talk, and beautiful architecture. Go where the gospel is preached and go off. It's a quote by, it was credited to Charles Pogeon. It says, go often. Go where the gospel is preached. I know we are preaching the gospel here, but brethren, show, let your love and tolerance to man be tested among men that are close to you in front. But don't go to a shrine. It is go to where the gospel is preached. So, the word of God is what Jesus used to bring out Lazarus is the same word of God that gave the command of what the people of God should do. So, you know, this is what I wrote down in my note. Psalm 119, 160. The sum of your word is truth. If you put all the word of God together, sum total is equal to truth. And I wrote here that Jesus raised Lazarus through his words and also only by his word he loosed him because he sent his word. It's at the command of his word that the people took action to lose him. And you see, anywhere you go, the word of God is what they must be using to perfect you. Lazarus was loosed, but was still bound. He was uh, raised from the dead, but was still bound. So, now, let me now go to the part B of this, which was revolutionary to my mind yesterday. I was, I was spinning. Now, when you look at Lazarus, when Jesus got to the grave and raised Lazarus up, please, can somebody give me five points of things, steps that Lazarus took to be reawakened to life? One, praise. Hallelujah. Yes. Two, kingdom service. Yes, sir. Three, communion. Hmm. Four, seed. Hmm. And five, tight. Wow. So that means that in the grave, there's ATM card working there. <laughs> and maybe they are sweeping in here and they needed somebody to sweep. But you see, Lazarus did nothing. He contributed nothing to his being raised up. In fact, when we look at it now, 
Let me, let me play the scenario to you the way we are supposed to react to people. His sisters interceded on his behalf. Rachel's. Yes. Uh uh. Just everything Paul said, Lazarus did it before he died, though. Hey, so it was speaking for him. Yeah, uh, it was speaking for him. <laughs> But you see, those things, those things could not prevent him from dying. So how could they be the one to raise him up? If a bulletproof could not pre prevent the bullet from eating you, that same bulletproof could not raise you up. So when you look at this Lazarus, his sisters interceded on his behalf by going to Jesus, by sending for Jesus, but Lazarus himself had no, no part to play. Now, this is a parallel that Brother Paul gave us yesterday and was spinning in my mind. Ephesians chapter 2, I'll read from 4, just to put it in context. Because 5 starts from that even so. But God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life. When he raised Christ from the dead, it is only by God's grace that you have been saved. To your salvation story, you had no part to play. How many of us here have given our life to Christ? Can we raise our hands up? Any other person? Please unmute or speak. Unmute and speak. If you can't show us a picture or use the raise hand. Yes, come in. You have given your life to Christ. <laughs> yes. I'll give you my life to Christ. I'll give giving your life to Christ too. Okay. Praise the Lord. Praise Hallelujah. the Lord. Hallelujah. Yes. I. I before I thought I gave my life to Christ, mm -hmm. but now that I know the truth, I realize it's Christ that gave me his life. I never gave my life. Uh -huh. Aha, sister Caroline. Uh -huh. That's it. I never gave my life. Yeah, because he you were dead. Life to me. A yes. dead uh -huh. man has no life to offer. No, I didn't give my life. That's what I thought before. Yeah, that's it. You have no life to give him because you were dead. Think about it. Dead and buried. What do you have to offer him? Okay, sorry, before we go too far. You said the sister inter interceded on his behalf. Putting and, it, uh, so in that I just case, said putting it in our perspective today because it was the sister that sent for Jesus. So, as a believer, when you see someone... That was when he was still alive. That was when he was sick. He was not sick. <laughs> that was when he was sick. He was not no, sick. No, they said... And when he was sick, yes. Said, okay, please, can you read that, please? Yes, when that he was, was sick. That was when he was sick. Yes. That they said, the, whom you love is sick. Sick, yes. And that was when Jesus Christ waited and he died four days. Or was it that they told yeah, him you he got it. died? You got it. Continue. That is right. Yours. So, is so today if you see anybody. So, you said the sister. Your voice is shake, cutting in and out. So, we can Hello. We can hear Sister Kemi. Okay. So, I'll mute you Sister Kemi because we can't hear you. So, his sisters, I said, putting it into this. Oh, aspect, sorry, I'm no, doing my sister intervene. Hello. Okay, go ahead. Is not what I'm saying. I said, putting it into this perspective, it was his sister that sent for God. So when you see a believer that is sick or is dead, or somebody that is still alive physically but dead spiritually, your goal is to pray to God about the person. Because you yourself, that you are alive in Christ, cannot give your life for that person. It still depends totally on God. When you say intercede, intercede, what power do you have to make the, power, the prayer to be answered? 
So what they used to tell us in the <laughs> intercede, intercede is, Auntie, your network is not stable. So I want you to, so you have no power of your own. So as I was saying, a dead, we were dead. We have no life to offer Christ, to offer God. In fact, it is, you know, I now paid attention after yesterday that what they used to say in my church is, when did you come to know the Lord? <laughs> they don't say, when well, you give your life to No, when did you come to know the Lord? Because it is now your understanding is unveiled. You now know that he is your Lord and your Savior. So, we had no life. But this God that is rich in mercy, they are buried Lazarus. They, are, they were ready to forget about him. But this God that is so rich in mercy had it in mind to demonstrate for us the journey, I'm paralleling this now to the journey of our salvation. We also being dead in Christ to this world, we were dead to everything. Christ came and offered us life. And the life he offered us is a full life, not a half life. Because that Lazarus still went to pastor a physical church here on earth. So, and verse 6 of Ephesians chapter 2 says, For he raised us up from the dead, along with Christ, and seated us with him in the heavenly realms, because we are united with Christ. But you see, when Lazarus came out, he was bound. Who are the people that put grave clothes around him in the first place? It was man. Grave clothes did not just appear. It was the people that wrapped him up. They wrapped him up through their laws, their tradition. They had many things. Today we have many things that they could use to wrap you up. When people die, you know, in Nigeria, when or I think it's generally in the world, when Muslims die, if they die before 4 p.m., they bury them the same day. If they die after, they bury them the next morning. That is their tradition. They wrapped Lazarus up. In Egypt, they mummified their pharaohs. But you see, those things are things put in place by man. And Jesus told them, you people that put it up, take it off. So today, many people or many denominations have created new wrappings, new bounds, new yokes for people. Oh, you can't, you, I can't go to church with this. You have to be in suit. Oh, you can't... Uh, we are part because we are deeper life. We have a deeper life. So don't wear trousers. Wear only skirt and it cannot be short. Those are things created by man. And until you use the word of God to unwrap all these cords, wrappings that they've tied around the work of God, you might not be able to enjoy the freedom that Christ has made available for us. Before, I used to be not mindful of words. But now that I realize the deposits of non-gospel that I've listened to for many years, and church traditions. Today, my pastor was demonstrating how the Roman Catholic did with their own laws. He said, this is the Bible. 
they created their own tradition. They put it like this. He said it was good. He said it was fine. He said, but other people came. They had it to the tradition. Others came. They had it to the tradition. He said later, they added to the tradition. He said when people look, you see more tradition than the Bible. He said later, they just did this. They put their tradition over the word of God. And the people will fight for the tradition and they will never get to the point of the word of God. He said if they have kept the tradition on one side and the tradition was correctly distilled from the word of God, the Bible, he said, well, there wouldn't be too much problem because that means that they use their understanding to interpret the Bible. He said, that's why we have some good books today. We, they use their understanding to interpret the Bible. And he said, it's perfectly fine. He said, but the moment you create a parallel, eventually tradition will go above the word of God. So brethren, we need not to lock ourselves down in the traditions of men. We need to make the word of God fully known. Psalm 119 verse 160 says, the sum total, when you add all the word of God together, it is equal to truth. And when it's equal to truth, that means that we need to elevate this word of God beyond anything else. Look at in uh, John 11:11, 11, 11, Jesus said something. Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but now I will go and wake him up. Because he only has the word of God. I think it was in John chapter 8, Jesus spoke to his disciples and told them that, let us go and do something. I think it was John chapter 8 was the first time he put them in company that we are going to do this. But yeah, he said, I. Jesus alone, the word of God only, not plus. The moment they put a plus, there's a problem. So when you now look at it, when Jesus called his disciples, you remember Mark's account, what he was very famous in his office, come, follow me, and I will make you. The word of God is what is able to make us. So when we look at this John 11 and the story of Lazarus, it's pointing us to what we are doing now. Just keeping focus at the word of God. Making us to understand that the word of God is supreme over all things. Sister Caroline, you raise your hand. Okay, praise the Lord. <laughs> Just say the word of God is so brief. What about the man of God that God has given a secret? <laughs> what about the man of God that God has the secret of this ministry? He's only me. I'm the only one that knows it. He is so, right. The secret of his ministry is the only one that I'm has the only one that knows it. The, the man is correct. Nobody else knows it. <laughs> The God church. is always talking to me. The I'm, church telling me I'm telling me, son, son, son. Don't worry. You know, <laughs> I've realized now, it is very easy for anyone to lay claim on anything. In fact, the chair you are sitting on in your house, it's only you that knows the story about it. None of us know. The same thing with those people. is their ministry, they are the only ones that knows. But you see, they are not the word of God. They are supposed to use 
the word of God to shape on us, but they have created their own parallels, their own bounds, their own cords, their own ropes, their own chains, traditions, and they've elevated it above the word of God. So that if, if the Bible were to be rewritten, <laughs> their own words can be added. We, we enter. It's true. I know who said that phrase very well. It's our dear friend, Mrs. Aga. So, <laughs> when you look at John 11, Lazarus was raised from the dead. He died eventually. That is not the purpose why that story made it here. The reason why that story made it here is for us, one, to believe, to continue to believe, and two, for us to have reliance on the word of God. The word woke him up. The word gave command for him to be used. So when we look at John 11, and we know that Lazarus rose from the dead, having been helpless in the grave, we should remember that for me to be saved, I did nothing of my own. It is the love of God that found me. So anyone that asks you to do anything in this work of your salvation is a scammer. Bring $300 to complete 30 days fasting is a scam. $520 as a seed of completion because Nehemiah completed the world in 52 days is a scam. And if we tell people to give us $1 billion, Naira, is a scam. Come and see me in the office. That is scam multiplied. So anything that changes our focus to your effort. Oh, you will now shout. You will now pray. Oh, see, go and see the lives of our workers. Serving God pays. If you don't serve God, things will not happen to you, but when you serve God, God will remember you to some day. Brethren, we need to rid ourselves of all these things. and put our reliance only on the word of God. It was the word that raised Lazarus up, and it was the word that loosed him from the bounds of human effort. It was human effort that wrapped Lazarus. So let us not put our trust in our flesh, let us not put trust in what, whatever we can do. Let us rely solely on God. Because God, the sum total of his word is true. And it is when <laughs> we rest on his truth that we find peace for our soul. So, how many of us here have given our life to Christ? <laughs> you are a troublemaker. All right. Family, this is where I I'm... did. <laughs> you did? Ah, is that Kenny? Okay. So how, how did you have your life to give to him? I surrendered my life. But the Bible says that you were dead. You need to rewind... This teaching has started. I know. I heard. I heard the answer. Uh -huh. Okay. All right. I heard. I heard the answer. Okay, that's good. So, please, it is very important for us to know that the word of God remains the only solution. His purpose is not to alleviate your pain. His purpose is to keep your eyes on, him. on trusting in God. All right, bro. So, so, so God does not need uh, someone to help to complete His work. <laughs> no, no, no. Ah, no, no. And that's one of the things that uh, the liar has told us before. 
that God still uses men to complete his work. No. They are not not completing his work. You see, the word of God has been given to us a long time. Even before Jesus came, Jesus' words has already been packaged in the Old Testament. But you see, the way it was packaged in the Bible is been there forever. So man has no part to play other than to re-echo the word of God. That is our job. And every true minister of God just need to re-echo the word of God. And that is enough for the people of God. Brother, Paul, think, contribution uh, for us tonight. Yes, I think, I think uh, the best way that thou center should be rephrased is anybody who is accepting the, the sacrifice that Jesus Christ has done for them, come out. Not say, come out and give your life to Christ. If you have accepted the sacrifice that Jesus Christ paid on the cross, if you have believed it, come out. But I know... In perspective, the coming out doesn't get anyone born again. Either you come out or you, you freeze the grammar. No, it doesn't get anyone born again. It is when we hear the gospel and we believe that we are born again. Why church wants people to come out is that we don't give birth to children and throw them in the bush. We give birth to children and you take care of them. So that is the purpose of that community, just for accountability. So there's nothing spectacular about, so about Otako. It's an invention of the 19th century. It never existed. It was not part of the deal. But it's good to also know the new children we just gave birth to so you can have a plan to nurture them. But what gets anyone to be spirit filled is when anyone hears the gospel anytime and anywhere. It could be on your bed, it could be in the car, it could be in the flight, in the plane flying. So, I give us a question, please. So if, if that is the case, how about the part where um, the Bible says, with your mouth, confession is made unto salvation. So I know that usually when they call them out, they usually say, give, do a confession. And we All right. That, confession. that is Romans 10, 9. Let's go there. Oh my God. Let Bible speak for itself. Let Bible interpret itself. Romans 10 and verse 9. If you openly declare, let's start from verse 8. In fact, it says, the message is very close at hand. It is on your lips and your heart. And the message is the very message about faith that we preach. If you, can, if you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God. And it's by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. As the scripture tells us, anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. It starts from the message. It's not when you call people out. Okay, say after me. That is called inducement. That that is seduction. There's a way I can speak and uh, one million people will come out. Mm, I want to pray for some people here, but I just mm-hmm. pray for have demon. If if you don't give a life to Christ, the demon will jump out of them and jump out of you because you're not born again. If you don't want demon to jump inside you, come out. Come then on. crowd will come out. Then I will not lead them to say, repeat after me, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus. That is not what gets anyone born again. It starts from the message of Christ. It starts from the gospel that you hear. Then you believe in your heart. Then you, this is not a service. This one, this one Paul is saying it's not a, it's not a, a, a church program. When you hear the message, because in that message is the power. Uh, Romans 1 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God. Oh, God. God. So when you hear the gospel, you can hear it in the church. You can hear it in your bedroom. But when you hear the gospel and you believe the gospel and you respond accordingly, Anywhere you hear the gospel, that's it. But when somebody put fear 
Their demons in the atmosphere. Oh no, I oh, will say, ah, I'm very rich. I have four jets. If you want to have money like me, give your life to Christ. Oh no, go go, go like that. Won't I go? I will go. So, I mean, I just want helicopter. I don't want jets. Okay. Want helicopter one. <laughs> what? Who would go? Then when you not get to the other, you not say, repeat after me, Lord Jesus. Lord. After that, they're not say, okay, follow these people. They'll take your name. Nobody's going to take your name. Mm. It's time for the message that you hear and that you believe. If you hear it in church and Holy Ghost leads the person preaching, now if you have responded to this message and preached, please come out. Okay. It is not that coming now that God then born again. It's just for mm. the message they hear and they believe. You know, Ephesians 3.20 says that to him who is able to do exceedingly abundant far above all we think and imagine or ask. But, God, see, the thought in your mind is as clear to God, is clear to God than your words. Because sometimes what you are thinking, you are even unable to express it. Mm. So when you come to that point in your heart, you don't deal. Do you hear what Sam said? I think Sam 19. The words of my mouth and meditation. When you hear the word hand in the Hebrew dictionary, it means kai, K I A, which means the word, which means which is. So with the word of my heart, which, which is the word the of my mouth, which is the meditation of my mouth, because it is from that heart that you speak. So when you hear the word of my mouth and the, you think there are two things. It's in fact, God bless you. Jesus spoke, he said, out of the abundance of the bed. Of the heart. heart. The so, so you know that what Sam is saying is not two things, it's one. The word of my mouth, which is the meditation of my heart, is the gospel that you hear and that you believe that God that gets you. So it boils down to what you do here. Ah, before is, you to first Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1 to 3. Can let's look at it. First Corinthians 15. <laughs> if I'm going to read it from First Corinthians 15. Let's read it from Old English, even though I don't like it. First Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 to 3. Moreover, oh, brethren, I declare unto you a gospel. Okay, but I can't read it. I don't like it. I declare to you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, Damn. by which also ye are saved. If ye keep in memory, what I preach unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. in vain. If you keep in memory what I preach unto you. It didn't say you speak it out in memory, unless <laughs> you have believed in vain. And what is that thing that you have to keep in memory? Verse 3. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, According to the scriptures. So what did you hear that made you say, I am a believer? Is it that if come to our church or come to Christ, you'll be blessed? Or is it that come to Christ, all the demons will go? What did you hear? You know, yes, I always like that phrase. I can never forget it. What? Because that was when I realized. Yeah, actually. I can tell you before I said I'm grieving. This that says Jesus of our church will make it to be successful. When I will say Jesus of that church will make it to be rich, MFM will say Jesus of that church will deliver demons. Those are not gospel. They are mere human empty philosophies. Stakeni has been trying to raise up her hand. Mm -hmm. Recently, I was speaking to someone. And I have an understanding about something that the gospel of Christ should be the same everywhere. Simple. But, yes, but unfortunately, we have so many denominations with different rules and regulations, if I may use that word. Because mm. what applies in redeem is not what applies in winners. Mm. What applies in it's not what applies in the deeper life. What applies in deeper life is not what applies in four squares. So they have their own doctrines all over. So I'm, I was telling that person, I said to me, I just, I thank God for the understanding, I thank God for the platform like this, that we are sharing the true word of God that is making some of us to understand better and to really, to really apply our mind and to see 
the truth of the word of God. Because if the gospel of Christ is the same thing that is preached all over, we will not have all this mess. Confusion. Yeah. We won't have it. But unfortunately, yeah. I thank God for Gosha, for some of us that have been delivered. Thank God. So thank you so much for your for sharing the word all the time. Sister Kenny, please open your Bibles to First Timothy yeah. chapter 4 and verse 1. Any version? First what? First Timothy chapter 4. Verse one. First Timothy chapter four. If I use KDV. Okay. But the Spirit said expressly that in later times some shall fall away from faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. See that what, what is it? Is it in plural or in singular? Pura. Okay. Whenever you see doctrines, it's never referred to Christ. Yeah. Because in the doctrine of Christ, there's only one. The teachings of demons. So, so what is it? He said in the later times, many shall depart from the faith, given into seducing spirit and doctrines of demons. Hey. You never hear doctrines of Christ. There's <laughs> one doctrine. <laughs> but when you see doctrine in plural form, <laughs> Is 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 an indication of innovation of another being from another realm. In other words, indication of demonic influence, and those yeah. are the effect of the last times, effect of later times. They forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods. Hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. so. Is there a difference between giving your life and surrendering your life, <laughs> your will to Christ? <laughs> Uh, right, that is my is my advocate. Is there, I did said, is there a difference between giving your life to Christ and surrendering your will to Him? We don't. Let's let's knock that giving your life to Christ. No, no there's no giving. Yeah. I, 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 I just thought of something now. When when the when the sister that answered that question said, you now I mean when you when we talked about it that the sister was saying that now he understood that nobody can give their life. How many people will God will Jesus Christ take their lives? <laughs> but, right, but right that he's the one that gave us his own life he died for us he's a so nobody can give him the alert oh, so for for surrendering will is a continuous thing for believers we will Every always day. have to need to surrender our will to god so it's something in fact the whole essence the sum total of what we are doing daily is sur surrendering our will to him. You know, today I was speaking with my wife today and I said, the, one of the reasons why we pray that, Lord, let your will be done. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when we say, Lord, let your will be done, in other words, you want to please God. And in pleasing God, that means you have to love even the unlovable. I found someone today that it was difficult for me to love her. I have to pray, Lord, I need your help so I can love the unlovable. See, the will of God is not always easy, and that's why we pray. Jesus did the same thing. When it was time for him to depart, it was not easy. He had to go pray for strength that comes from God. So I have to pray, God, just help me to love, because we, we don't have excuse not to love. Oh, that person was too difficult. That's why I did not love. You don't have any excuse. You must love the unlovable. So I have to pray to God to help me. See, that's, that's surrendering to God's will right there. That one is ongoing. Jesus comes. We'll keep doing that. But giving your life to Christ does not exist. Lazarus <laughs> don't have any life to give. He was dead and stinking. And that's what happens to anyone who is not in Christ. He's dead. He's deaf. <laughs> His story is a double jeopardy. He was dead and they bound him. So it's useless that to, it, all it's good for is to rot him. Have you brought us? Oh, yeah. All Lazarus was used for was to just rot him away. Rot him, yeah. But Christ brought him to life. That is the picture of anyone that becomes human being. We were dead and deaf. But the grace of God brings us back to life. And that's why we have to rejoice. And that's why we have to now see why did Jesus raise Lazarus? Why? Verse 5 said, he loved Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. It was love that motivated him. So why did Jesus die for us? He loved us. He loved us. He loved us. It was not that Jesus died 
after he died, he now used his death to bribe God. See, so, I don't die. I carry that cross, it's heavy. And God now said, okay, okay, don't try, don't try. So I forgive them. No, his love was what, what motivates him to send Jesus to us. So let everybody live today with a new revelation of God's love. God really loves us. He loves us. That's all we have for today, bro. So concerning for our Ibadan, bro, it does, do we need an announcement? We have anyone that wants to. Uh, sorry, sorry, before we go into that, I also have a question. Okay. Should we keep it on record or I should stop? Uh, let's stop. Okay.